Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, to discuss how today's clinician network management vendors are tackling the many interoperability problems facing healthcare delivery organizations today. We are pleased to host this webinar in following up on our recent report covering this space called the 2017 Clinician Network Management Market Trends Report. If you're familiar with our reports um, in the past, our market trends reports are really our vertical defining pieces of content that dig deep into a specific area that we cover and provide very thorough vendor profiles and analysis of the market space. Today, we will be led by Brian Murphy, who is a senior analyst here at Chillmark Research. Our team here at Chillmark Research is united by the belief that effective deployment and use of IT is essential to modernizing care delivery and ultimately improving the patient journey to health. Understanding the emerging trends and technologies to enable this is what drives our choice of research topics each year. It is our goal to provide objective, forward-thinking insights that will help create an informed market of stakeholders that can truly impact our care delivery system. Today's speaker is Brian Murphy, our lead interoperability analyst here at Chillmark Research and primary author of the 2017 Clinician Network Management Market Trends Report. Brian has been with Chillmark since 2012 when he came on board to assist with our coverage of the HIE space. He has since shifted focus to interoperability issues and solutions more generally as legacy HIE products were incapable of the more robust data exchange necessary to truly impact the healthcare delivery process today. He has also been leading our analytics research for the past couple of years. So be on the lookout for a new market trends report for the analytics domain at the end of May. Um, Brian is a graduate of both Harvard College and Suffolk Law School. When he's not thinking about healthcare, he is either running or acting as an armchair Boston historian. So without further ado, I would like to let Brian take over. Hi, uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I apologize. We're a couple of minutes uh, late getting started today. Uh, you won't be shocked to learn that uh, John and I were having uh, interoperability problems. Uh, we, we had to uh, exchange uh, Word documents and PDFs and uh, PowerPoints here, and uh, things didn't go entirely according to plan. In any event, we're here, and I, today I, I basically just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about our most recent market trends report for people who are not necessarily familiar with Chillmark Research. We publish a bunch of different things, but our kind of our anchor publication, at least so far, has been this thing called a market trends report. They're big and they're kind of difficult to wade through. Uh, they kind of overview a market. They describe the different vendors who are involved in that market, and we also provide an evaluation of those vendors' offerings in the form of uh, letter grades and various uh, graphs that kind of position them. So if you haven't had a chance to see it or if you're interested in purchasing it, there's a lot more information report than we're, we're, we're going to cover today. Uh, this is essentially what I'm hoping to get through in the next 40 minutes or so. Just start with a brief review of kind of where things stand. Uh, talk about the current state of the technology that's used in this market, the current state of the organizations that are involved, because uh, to, to a large extent, uh, the, the, the one doesn't exist without the other. I'll talk about the report itself and the vendors that are included in it. And finally, I want to kind of wrap up with some of the newer ideas about uh, developing applications in, 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 in a distributed computing environment and uh, leveraging those applications to do better healthcare. I, I also just wanted to kind of mention that we are going to be transitioning this coverage to something different probably at the end of this year. So this is essentially the last version of this report uh, that we're, we're, we're planning to do. Uh, I know that a lot of the folks who might be on the call have, have kind of been with this report for uh, a number of years, uh, but for a lot of different reasons, we think it's sort of time to begin covering this in a slightly different way. So without further ado, we'll go on to the next one. So HIE, or Health Information Exchange, uh, was even when it was sort of a new term, was really kind of uh, the latest way to describe uh, something that had been around for a long, a long time. The, the idea that uh, organizations need the ability to move data around uh, not only more easily, but more productively. There's been a, a longstanding need for providers in, in one health organization to 
kind of get access to and use uh, data that exists in, in a different organization. So the the focus of, of HIE kind of as it was originally conceived and in terms of how, how it rolled out was really kind of on hospitals and doctor's offices and getting useful information to the point of care to support decision-making right in front of a patient. Now, nobody can, with a straight face, claim that that job is finished. Um, there's still lots of places where that the idea of being able to kind of look up basic patient information can make a difference, but it's not. But to focus on what remains to be done is to really, I think, overlook how much you know how much has really been accomplished in the last uh, uh, five to ten years. Uh, so it, it is fair to say that you know, nevertheless, it's it's fair to say anybody will tell you that the current approaches, while good, really could could uh, stand to um, could stand some improvement. Now, for people who follow healthcare, <clears throat> we'll all know that the last two weeks have been sort of uh, uh, eventful. Um, even though there is, in the end, there is no, you know, no actual consequence. Um, I think there was, you know, the, the the general level of uncertainty has probably kind of uh, decreased a little bit. Uh, it hasn't been eliminated. The current administration still has a whole battery of rulemaking and enforcement powers at its disposal. And, um, you know, it's not clear how, how those are going to be used. We know that last year, uh, Congress kind of rolled up a bunch of pre-existing programs into MACRA. How aggressively or not the new administration decides to kind of roll that out is, you know, is, is really anybody's guess. But what I think the, the one thing that really hasn't changed is this, this idea of value-based care and value-based payment is... I, nobody's saying that that's going to go away. So payers, whether they're government, whether they're private, they're going to continue to implement things that move us away from fee-for-service. So I, I, I think that the long-term trend to kind of move care to lower, you know, lower intensity, lower cost venues is probably going to continue and, and accelerate. And that means that the need for different organizations to work together to take care of uh, individual patients and panels of patients is only going to increase. One of the thing, one of the characteristics of uh, past approaches to this problem is they're, they tended to focus on what at the time were regarded as places that best, you know, that, that where there was the best opportunity to deliver efficiencies, hospitals and doctor's offices. But value-based care occurs in a lot other pla- a lot of other places besides hospitals and doctors' offices. So this means that there's a a great deal of opportunity in other healthcare venues, uh, notably in the different venues that kind of make up uh, post-acute care. Payers are also far more uh, intensely interested in this kind of data or the data that you know you you, you traditionally associated associate with with HIE than they have been in the past. And, uh, the, you know, provider organizations in general, and I, you know, there's all kinds of exceptions, but in general, are, are, uh, you know, they were not super enthusiastic about sharing, uh, but that seems to be changing uh, as they rethink their, you know, th- their need to, you know, do better care coordination, to take on risk and to, to achieve their revenue goals. The other thing that, you know, has always been sort of an afterthought with respect to hospital and office uh, type clinical data is clinical research. And that is uh, definitely the, the, the research crowd were some of the biggest movers behind this, this uh, the, the emphasis on, on, on open API. So, so those folks are also kind of clamoring uh, to, to, to get access to this kind of data. When you look at you know, how health information exchange organizations have kind of rolled out and how they work. I, you know, as of several years ago, basically pretty much any hospital or doctor's office in the United States that wanted to be hooked up to an HIE could, at least in a theoretical sense. Now, the major sponsors of these kinds of efforts were state, you know, the, the states, the uh, state designated entities. Those were funded partly you know, by the feds through uh, a piece of legislation called SHIDCAP. Um, so some of this money was also used in some states to kind of put together uh, regionally focused HIE organizations. 
And there were a variety of non-state funded regional organizations that have kind of popped up, popped in and out of existence to provide um, exchange services. You know, whilst a lot of these efforts, you know, some have thrived, some haven't thrived, clearly. Some have shut down. Some never really got beyond the initial planning stages to begin with. The, the, I think the, the sort of primary obstacles are, are well understood by most people. First of all, there's uh, the financial viability has always been a, a challenge. A lot of participants are just not willing to pay for access to this kind of data or the services uh, that, that they provide. And there's also a tremendous unwill, or there has been uh, historically an unwillingness on the part of some participants to share this data because uh, nobody wants to lose patients. So in general, and this has been true for a couple of years, it's, it's primarily the kind of large hospitals and health systems, these kind of big healthcare enterprises, or in some cases not so big, that have really been the primary driver for this market. They're uh, less, uh, they're able to kind of do this for their own purposes and, and um, are not in a position where they need to necessarily make money on this. They're expanding. You know, there's been a tremendous expansion in physician networks for the larger healthcare organizations over the last couple of years. And they, at least uh, most of them, are have kind of jumped feet first into various kinds of risk sharing organizations. So those are sort of the organizational sponsors. Meanwhile, direct secure messaging is a kind of a it's, you know, it's just a sort of a, a standard that's out there and it continues to grow. You know, the numbers of transactions and the number of participants just, you know, keeps going up every year. Now, nobody really knows for sure how many of the messages that are being transmitted are actually opened and used, but it's fair to say that, you know, somebody must be using them or, they, or, or nobody would be sending them. While I, I think, you know, we in the past, and I think wrongly, uh, we're a little bit dismissive of direct as a kind of check the box way to meet a transition of care requirement. Uh, it is an altogether reasonable alternative to fax. It's easy to set up. It's it's pretty much easy for any user to sort of comprehend and begin to use. So, you know, direct for 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 better or worse is kind of here to stay. Uh, there are you know now there's also been these various vendor consortiums that are trying to move the needle. Most people are familiar with Commonwealth and Care Quality, um, and these are essentially efforts to kind of build uh, kind of MPI and record location type services into EHRs. Uh, the last year, the, I'd say you know 2016 was a little bit confusing uh, with respect to both of these efforts. The uh, you know these were essentially feuding constituencies within the healthcare IT kind of community. I think Commonwealth clearly had a head start by mid-2016. They were enabled on a whole bunch of EHRs. But when I talked to a lot of uh, a lot of the customers who, who kind of had these Commonwealth-enabled EHRs last summer, there really weren't, there really wasn't much in the way of transaction volumes. But by the end of 2016, you know, by the end of last year, a couple of things had happened. Number one, people are telling me that the, trans the transaction volumes are starting to pick up. Second, a thing that I think is important is that Commonwealth and Care Quality, Keston made up um, and agreed to inter interconnect. Now, it, it's not entirely clear what that means from a functional standpoint. You know, I'm sure that it's you know some sort of CDA type exchange, but it does seem clear that these two efforts could potentially reach a very high percentage of uh, the EHR users who are out there, and that fact by itself. Uh, is going to drive some usage. Whether the technology is is equal to that usage is, is, I think, still an open question. Now, when you look at what, regardless of you know who's sponsoring it or kind of what they're using, most of the use cases for HIE have been provider centric. Essentially, physicians and nurses kind of use this stuff, and they find out stuff about the patient that's in front of them. And that's great. It's just that it's really uh, the I think the you know the the world has evolved to where they're really you know they, they, the requirements are much more involved in that. The the actual technology that most people use HL7 IHE profiles CDA documents it's true. There's there aren't a lot of things that people want to do that they can't do in some way, shape, or form uh, with, with HL7, IHE, and CDA. But it, 
to be fair, I think it's it's important to 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 note that the the supply of programmers who understand these technologies it's not growing. Um, it's certain, or or if it is growing, it's not as growing as fast as the demand for uh, new applications. So just these last two items here are really meant to just underscore that the potential for expanding the relevance of exchange beyond a kind of narrow user base and 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 a narrow set of use cases is is there. So uh, our next slide. Yeah, I just uh, this uh, I I just want to use this to kind of illustrate the fact that. HIE was never really the only game in town. Uh, I think some people may have thought that it was intended to kind of consolidate every potential valuable data source in healthcare. And it just, you know, it just was never true. There was a whole battery of companies with, you know, data and services that help HCOs deal with patient care or with payments. And what this fig in the, these, this is just a, minor sampling of uh, different kinds of uh, networks and services that are out there. There's there's literally, you know, hundreds or probably thousands of these. What this figure doesn't really convey is how narrow the scope of some of these offerings are. And, and it also doesn't show how duplicative they can be or how much, you know, each one of these also, there's also a certain time and effort cost involved in kind of signing up and, and interacting with them. Everyone's got its own onboarding, credentialing, technical interfaces, et cetera. So, but the, the idea that we're trying to convey here is that there's really no such thing as one-stop shopping for healthcare related data. And it's, you know, that the data is always going to be kind of here and there and around in different places. And I, and I think the, the sooner we uh, kind of recognize that this is the reality. That I think it, we're going to be in a in a better place with respect to figuring out how to get it when you need it. A lot of the discussion about the kinds of data that people are interested in uh, kind of you know really boils down to what they're trying to accomplish. And traditionally in 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 HIE, uh, that was essentially clinical data lookup, getting lab results from hospitals to physician offices. You know, and the idea was to kind of make things more efficient. Um, and as risks-based contracts became more common, there was a need to kind of marry some claims data to that clinical data. So I guess our feeling at this point is that that sort of combination of EHR data and claims data is to some extent table stakes for, for most vendors uh, these days. But people are also beginning to talk in far more serious terms about other kinds of data that, you know, for lots of other, you know, different use cases, whether it's patient care, whether it's, you know, a better understanding of risk, the kind of range and type of data sources that people are mentioning specifically, you know, continues to grow. Now, a lot, you know, people have been talking about a lot of these for quite some time, but, uh, I, you know, I'm beginning to sense that the kind of the industry is at a, po is at a point where the, it's, you know, it's time to stop talking. So correlating some of these data sources that we show here in blue to your aggregated clinical and claims data store is going to give you a better understanding of risk. If a patient says, you know, they don't smoke, but their credit card records are telling you that they've been buying cigarettes for 30 years, you know, there's some reason to have a discussion. Um, you know, people, they're talking about using weather forecasts to predict when patients are going to need inhalers or, you know, supermarket records to find out more about what people are eating. So this, uh, you know, this is a reality for us now. And, and, and current, um, most of the kind of current organizations and technologies are not particularly good about dealing with data in the blue there. So this, uh, the, the, one of the things, you know, when you talk, when, at least when we talk to um, healthcare organizations, the, one of the things they always mention is the fact that their users are drowning in irrelevant data. So at any given time, the universe of data that's available is always significantly broader than the data that's actionable, that's meaningful to the user at a particular time. And in general, I think, you know, this is the challenge with data. It's, it, it's, you know, we need technology that's a little bit smarter about sorting through and, and, and figuring out what data is going to make a difference for what user at, 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 what, at what time. And just to kind of uh, go into this a little bit deeper, 
the uh, most people, you know, most users and, and most programmers for that matter, you know, understand that, you know, they have access to data within their particular little application set, but they're, they know that there's data in that looks, you know, that's essentially similar in other organizations or in other parts of the organization. So that's the distinction between kind of local and remote data. They also know that there's data out there about a patient or about a panel that they don't know anything about. Now, whether it's, you know, whether or, or that they don't have access to, that they can't get at. Now, whether it's because it's truly unknown, a true unknown unknown, or if it's they know that it's probably out there and it, and it you know, it might help, doesn't really matter. I mean, it's so, so data is either accessible or it's not accessible. The uh, HIE has done a tremendous amount. I think, you know, the, 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 you know, the, Initial idea of kind of moving data from remote systems to the local system of the user. I think we've gotten a lot better at that. I think where we haven't gotten better is uh, moving data from this sort of completely unknown uh, into into what's understandable to the user or or or, or to the application. So. An example of this would be, uh, we know that every EHR has a vast collection of clinician notes and there's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff in there that frankly is, you know, even though it's right there at the user's fingertips, there's no way they're going to find it. So while the technology that we've associated with, with HIE has done a tremendous amount in terms of uh, kind of bringing more data to bear for users and applications. There's, you know, there's there's pieces of this that HIE never really was able to get at. So anyway, that just kind of sets the stage. The talk a little about the report itself. So I think, as I said earlier, you know, we've been doing this report for a number of years. I think this is the third one that I did. The, you know, this year the report describes the offerings of eight different vendors that are shown here on this slide. That's down from over 20 vendors several years ago. Every one of these vendors has a significant ability to aggregate data from a bunch of sources and use that data to, to feed EHRs, clinician portals, patient portals. They're all able to send and receive some form of CDA to uh, different organizations for, you know, within a network. All of them have a lot of experience uh, incorporating this data into uh, workflows and, and, and care processes. Given that we think that it's going to be the larger healthcare enterprises that are going to be kind of the major drivers of uh, a lot of uh, value-based healthcare, uh, we think that the hospital-focused EHR, EHR vendors have a kind of inside track here. They tend to be a little bit closer to the workflows. They understand the data. They understand the um, kind of the business requirements uh, that are kind of driving these organizations. And they're in a position to kind of, you know, show a little leadership inside of a, of a, a healthcare community. Most of these, these possible EHR vendors are also casting around for new revenue sources beyond their EHR bases. So, I guess our conclusion is that they that that the hospital EHR vendors probably have a pole position. By that token, it's it's not necessarily clear that they always have a any sort of really striking product advantages. And so so the so the the the, the non EHR vendors you see on this list can still put together some very competitive uh, solutions. Now that said, some of these other companies, Orion Health and InterSystems, they, you know, they're not they are not EHR vendors in the United States, but they have strong EHR businesses in other parts of the world. So to some degree, they kind of share the at least the outlook of uh, our domestic U.S. EHR vendors. Uh, one of the things that's become really common over the last couple of years with uh, these vendors is that they like to position what they have as a data platform. Uh, the idea is that their kind of aggregated data is deep enough and broad enough that other players are going to want to develop applications uh, using it. Now, that said, there are other others of these vendors that that disagree with this 
positioning in, in, in fairly strong terms. You know, the reality is that this idea hasn't entirely worked out for anyone. I think in, part of that is that the, the tools for programmers are probably not exactly what the average independent developer is looking for. In part, it's, you know, the, the old problems of their customers being really willing to share uh, the data and, you know, wanting to make money off of it. But, I, you know, I, I guess my feeling is that, it, you know, this, this is not a bad idea. I mean, I think it could exist and I think it could be leveraged. I think, you know, we, we just need a little bit better technology and, and a little bit more progress toward a kind of value-based payment world to really set the stage for uh, making this idea of a data platform a reality. This, uh, I just wanted to kind of put this up. This kind of, this is a little bit of a compare and contrast of what we said in 2014 and what we said this year with respect to some, not necessarily, but not all these are, not all these different ideas are related to technology, but let me just talk a little bit about some of them. So the care coordination fees haven't really moved the needle much. I mean, it's there. Some people have used it. Our sense is that bundled payments are going to be probably a bigger deal going forward. The EH, you know, everybody knows the EHR incentive program put EHRs in the hands of everybody in the hospital and most of the folks in doctor's offices. There are vast un ehr segments of, of healthcare. And uh, so that, you know, and that, you know, that continues to be an issue. Uh, provider directories, a, this has been a requirement for decades. And I, you know, I, it doesn't really seem like there's a lot of movement on this. The nationwide patient identifier is, uh, oddly enough, I've got to say that the more physicians you talk to, I, maybe it's just the ones that I'm talking to, but they're, they think this is a good idea and that this could solve a lot of problems. The, um, still, I just think politically it's just uh, kind of a non-starter, but hope springs eternal. MPI technology, uh, you know, I know of one statewide HIE that runs their MPI job every month and it takes two weeks. Uh, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. The open APIs it's, is sort of a drum we have been beating for quite some time. We think that that is from a, from a technology standpoint, like we think that that has more potential to, to, to make data more liquid than everything that has happened in the last uh, uh, 10 years. A patient-mediated exchange is another idea that's been around for quite some time, and it and it make it it, ha, it 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 makes a lot of sense. The except when you think about the problems that patients have navigating the healthcare system, navigating providers, navigating the payment system. If you then ask them to determine who gets what kind of access to which data, it just strikes me as um, a bridge too far. The 21st Century Cures Act contains provisions for penalizing people who block uh, data from moving between organizations. I, I think there's two schools of thought. I think, you know, I, my sense is that's it's we're not going to see a lot of enforcement, but there are people who believe that that there, you know, two or three or four test cases will be sort of picked out. There'll be a big fine and uh, that, you know, the, the rest of the world will kind of fall into line. Uh, so that you know that that remains to be seen. So in any event, this kind of gives you an idea of what we what we did say and what we're saying now. So traditionally, we evaluated this technology based on its functionality, and this is kind of what this this is what we kind of used the last time around. We looked at the extent to which HIE was supporting these sort of application requirements. And I, without getting into the nitty details on each, and I'm sure there are people who will disagree with me uh, in, in some respects, our sense was that there wasn't a tremendous amount of, uh, functional, of this kind of functionality that people were building uh, using HIEs. Now, that's, that is not the same as saying that there was no functionality, because I think in uh, in, 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 you know, bits and pieces of, of, of these applications were being, you know, were being supported by a, a variety of different um, technology stacks. But in general, our sense was that the, that the, the progress on this was probably stalled. 
So uh, this year, we took a slightly different tack. And uh, rather than um, focus on the kind of the requirements of the application, we, we wanted to focus instead on the essentially the data liquidity. So the range and type of different data sources, how much it's being used, the abilities of each vendor to kind of source, at, you know, normalize and aggregate their uh, facilities for supporting application development, how big their networks are. So this, so this is essentially how we evaluated the products. If you are a subscriber or if you buy the report, you can kind of look at the specific way that we kind of measured this with, um, with respect to each vendor. This is a list of companies that have been in this report in the past that are not now. There's 12 vendors here. Almost all of them are still in business. Uh, they all have sort of different fates. First one there, and we're not going to go through each one in great detail, but Axolotl was once the fair-haired uh, vendor. Um, it was in many ways the leading HIE solution from a market uh, share standpoint. That company was acquired by Optum, which more or less, you know, withdrew this that that product from the market. But Optum didn't, you know, it withdrew the product. Optum is still in the market. You know, the while a lot of what Optum does is for uh, United Health, it's building a data aggregation and normalization product that it's going to, as, as I understand it, is going to be offered uh, uh, to the wider market. So almost every one of these companies is still involved in data aggregation, either as an analytics vendor or a care management vendor or both. The point is that uh, in the, you know, rather than trying to provide a basis for information exchange, they are providing a basis for their own set of applications. And I think this is an interesting place to end up for a lot of these vendors because because I do think it points to what is really the the most substantial unmet need, and that is, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the need to make data available for applications more quickly and more flexibly. So that leads us to. I, I want to talk about this this sort of. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm leading up to the topic of of um, data provisioning here. This is some. This is a theme that we hear over and over and over. Uh, we talk, we, you know, we talk to several vendors a week, and most describe more or less the same um, the same process. They have an idea for an application, they go out, they source the data, they build some kind of aggregated longitudinal patient record, and then they use that to run their application. And then the next application, they do exactly the same thing. So, what's really needed here is a fast and easy way to build that aggregated longitudinal patient record. We think that the requirement is really for you know for a, a kind of an on-the-fly longitudinal patient record or a disposable longitudinal patient record. And it's going to have to be HIPAA compliant. It's going to support all those data types and sources that we talked about. It's also going to have to be completely API enabled. We think that, you know Fire is obviously the the set that is the standard that I think. You know, most people are expecting are just going to have a really big impact in terms of making data more accessible. But there's also plenty of room for a vendor proprietary APIs, provided that they're open. You know, there's the the the, the kinds of longitudinal patient records uh, that I'm talking about really need you know to the extent that vendors can can make their data accessible with modern languages, modern tools. Obviously, we'll be in a better place. Uh, hopefully, this is going to produce applications that are a bit more patient-centric and um, give folks a better handle on not just care needs, but risk as well. So this is just sort of uh, an architectural diagram that describes sort of what I pretty much just talked about. So we're thinking that there's got to be a way to take data from source systems, patient match it, provider match it, normalize it, aggregate it and provision it out into a longitudinal patient record that anybody can access provided they you know meet the 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 the, the requirements set forth by the um by the organization um this is another way of looking at kind of the same thing we we think that you know 
one of the ways that people talk about the kind of the whole set of applications out here, there are systems of record. Usually people think of those as EHRs, systems of engagement, things like analytics and care management. Neither of those sets of applications, uh, I, I, in neither case are most users particularly thrilled with them. In other words, the systems of record need to be more engaging and the systems of engagement, quite frankly, need to be more engaging. They both need access to not only patient-specific data, but they need access to sets of data. So, so you know, to do things like uh, analytics. So, from uh, just a fun, kind of a last word here on open APIs, for as much attention as this topic has received over the last two years, you know, the realities of healthcare are such that coexistence with kind of HL7, IHE, things like direct. Is you know, is unavoidable in healthcare. You know the expectation is that open APIs are going to make it a lot easier for programmers and organizations that are less familiar with HL7, IHE, and Direct to develop applications. So open APIs, we think, can really uh, drastically expand the number of potential developers. So. The ONC or, or CMS is part of the MU3 requirements. And I think I mentioned at the outset that, you know, we're not quite sure how aggressively that's this is going to be pursued. But they, you know, MU3 requires uh, participants to provide open APIs to their systems. They don't specify what that open API is, but I think there's a, you know, it's it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that most people are going to be using FHIR to do that. Every vendor in this report has FHIR support some a little bit more than others. There is a, you know, the, the version 3.0 of the, the standard kind of just came out. So there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of activity, and, uh, you know, we're excited about it. And I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of excitement about uh, Fire and Smart on Fire and their potential for uh, making this problem a little bit easier to manage. Okay, last uh, slide before we get to um, questions. You know, we, you know, modern ideas about distributed development are unavoidable at this point. And I know that it's uh, people, you know, like to sit around and boo-hoo, we're in healthcare, we can't do it. That, that you know, th this is happening. You know, there's, the, the, the care models are changing and they need more and different kinds of data. There's more and different kinds of people involved in patient care. We do think that these kind of API programs that are going to make it easier to provision these provision data for applications are transformative or, uh, for, for HCOs. So, you know, we think that good data and interoperability going forward should have these characteristics. It increases efficiency and, and effectiveness at point of care, which was always the idea, but at lots of other places either as well. Uh, they should make it easier to get relevant data from this, the, the, the vast deluge of data that's available to most folks. They'll better leverage uh, unknown data and uh, generally put users, users into a position where they're m uh, much more trusting of the data that they see. So when, in the remaining few minutes, we have time for some questions, and we've already got a bunch. Okay, so the first question that we have is, which vendors are strongest in post-acute care? Well, I, I would say none of the above. I don't believe that any of the vendors, so I'm assuming that the questioner is referring to, you know, the vendors in this report. I, I, I'm, I don't think that anybody has sort of cornered the market on, on, on post-acute care. The, you know, those are traditionally separate and distinct EHR worlds. Now, almost all of those vendors have experience with post-acute use cases, but I, I, it's, it would be hard, I'd be hard pressed to, to, to pick out any one uh, and, 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 you know, honestly say that somebody is really that much better than any other. Okay, our next question is, is the concept of an HIA becoming a platform as a service no longer on the horizon um, going forward? I think that the, the idea always has been 
to turn this into a sort of a, a, a platform play. The as a service part, I think, is the more difficult part. You know, a lot of these, it's still not clear, you know, who's going to be willing to pay for this in the same way that they would pay for an EHR as a service from, say, uh, an Athena Health. So I do think that the combination of, you know, tech, you know, mo more modern technology, I think, is going to get us closer to a platform. Uh, whether somebody can really make this available on a kind of a, an as a service type basis is probably a little bit more questionable in my mind. Okay. You mentioned that we are going to be sunsetting the clinician network management um, report or that covers specifically. So what will be our focus going forward? And can you give any preview as to what kinds of reports um, we'll be releasing? In? The short answer to that question is we're still trying to figure that out. We expect that API programs are going to become a much bigger part of what a lot of vendors are offering their customers. And we also be, think that uh, healthcare, you know, particularly the bigger healthcare organizations are going to be a lot more interested in building API programs. So the specifics of kind of what we would cover from a, a product standpoint is, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. I think the how 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 uh, healthcare organizations are organizing to do this and the extent to which you know th this becomes part of risk contracts i think is another interesting aspect so i i know that that doesn't completely answer your question but uh you know we will at least for clients we will be keeping them up to date on um how, how this will unfold okay and our final question for the day is where do you see this market functionality residing in 5 years in a perfect world, the you know the the entire every data source in healthcare would be API enabled, and those APIs would be so well documented, and the the rules of the road for using those APIs would be so well understood that we wouldn't you know we wouldn't even be we won't there'd be no such thing as an exchange organization. It it is it it, it you know it it will just become an ordinary capability for any, you know, any piece of software that runs in a healthcare, healthcare organization. Now the, you know, five years, there's, I, I mean, I think there's zero chance that's going to happen. You know, 10 years, we're going to be a lot closer. Okay. I misspoke. So there's actually one more question. Can you talk more about provider data management? If it's been a requirement for a decade, why have payers and or vendors not solved the problem of incorrect provider data? Are there vendors who are better at this? I think you might be talking about uh, data quality. The one of the things that I think is, uh, at least from a kind of vendor product standpoint, that is incompletely distributed across the kind of landscape here is an emphasis on on quality. The um, I think for organizations that have long-standing relationships with each other. There's an, you know, there, there is an understanding about what the data should look like, and you know what constitute one, what constitutes usable data versus unusable data. So while I'm hesitant to uh, single out anybody who's particularly good at data quality, it does seem like it's an area that vendors are paying closer attention to particularly as they look to go beyond just the kind of their uh, their, their, their own set of customers. It's, you know, clearly a concern. And I, I just, you know, my fear is that for a lot of these, it's to some extent labor intensive. You know, somebody needs to be paying attention to data feeds that drop off the end of the earth or data feeds that suddenly, you know, start spewing garbage. But uh, this questioner points to uh, an important consideration and one that I think in, uh, the vendors are paying more attention to. All right. And with that, um, we've come to the end of the hour for this webinar. And we thank you for joining us this afternoon. We hope you will join us for the next webinar that we host and stay on the lookout for our future reports. I'll be following up with a copy of these slides.
as well as following up with a link to the report so that you can access that directly if you choose to purchase it. We hope everyone has a fantastic week and look forward to speaking with you again shortly.